Hello, I'm Mrs. Onuki, Space Frontier Foundation. I'm a coordinator of this session. The final session of World Space Highlight 3, New Space 2, is a leveraging small sat, commercial space business dynamics for small systems. We have six panelists today. Each panelist will make a 10-minute presentation, and then we will move to the panel discussion. This panel will be also live broadcast on the web by SpaceTube. SpaceTube is operated by a student team. Now is a time called the second space age, or Space 4.0. Innovative platforms, small sets, and their new applications are creating disruptive market. There are numerous small sat constellation business plans for both remote sensing and communication. Lots of small sat will be manufactured and launched, potentially over 22,000 new LE or satellites in the next 10 years. As a result, we will have a huge space-based data and information stream and global connectivity by small sat constellations. This will provide enormous contribution and changes in many industries, even in the mature industry sectors. Digitalization is a unifying force which ties space application and services to the mainstream terrestrial industry sectors. Now we can see the next investment frontier here. The VC horizon has expanded into space. Investment accelerates the small satellite business too. We are recently surprised that SoftBank invested in OneWeb as the largest space VC investor to date with $1.2 billion land B funding. The space data economy will lead LEO economic market development and create the foundation for the next big bang in space commerce. The first presentation is from Mr. Meya Moale, founder and CEO, Sky and Space Global. Thank you very much, Misuzu. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Misuzo has asked me to say a few words about myself, so I've been uh, with the Israeli Air Force most of my life. I've been a jet fighter pilot and was in charge also in the space systems program and space systems division, working on the Israeli space program and on the uh, first Israeli astronaut flight on board the Columbia uh, shuttle flight, STS-107. I have a bachelor degree in uh, mathematics, computer sciences and physics and a master's degree in national security and almost the final stages of my uh, PhD. So um, I'm very happy to be here and uh, tell you the uh, Sky and Space Global story uh, and adventure that started just a bit ago. So if you don't mind, we will start with uh, a short, oops. Uh, a few words about uh, what we believe in. Uh, because we seem to have lost a movie somewhere in the presentation. So Sky and Space Global believes that everybody are entitled to have uh, the opportunity to talk to one another, to communicate with one another. And basically what we will do is build an affordable network of nanosatellites in space that will allow people to communicate to anyone, anywhere, anytime. On the one hand, by, by the way, by a show of hands, uh, who in the crowd here heard before coming to hear about Sky and Space Global? Can you please raise your hand just so I can see? One, two, three. Well, it's a good thing I'm here then. <laughs> we started the company a year and a half ago in the United Kingdom, and we were funded by an Australia-listed company at the ASX. So uh, we are a listed company right now in Australia. 
Uh, ticker name, by the way, is SAS, if you want to look us up. Our ideas are very simple. On the one hand, we're thinking very small. We're thinking about the size of nanosatellites. Our first satellites, which I'll, sh I'll show you in a bit, are about this big, a small shoebox, 30 centimeters by 10 by 10. With these small satellites, we can provide you the ability to do a phone call, to send a text message, an instant message like WeChat or WhatsApp or something similar. You can check your email, you can uh, um, call your friends, you can even use machine-to-machine -machine devices or Internet of Things devices very, very easily. We're thinking very, very small on the capex. The capital required for us to build a constellation of 200 satellites is around $150 million. That's almost nothing if you think in terms of a space business. On the other hand, we're thinking very big. This is a disruptive company, full of innovation, about to transform the way people treat satellite communication. It will have a huge impact on society because we are targeting areas in the world with less fortunate people who have today nothing at all, like Central Africa, South and Central uh, America, and parts of Southeast Asia as well. Just imagine what happens in areas where there's no communication at all. You cannot check your email every second or post to Facebook or Instagram every minute or so. You have nothing. And there comes along a company that allows you better education, better health care, do a digital finance transaction over the phone, send and receive money, things that we take for granted, calling your mother, calling your daughter, finding out if she's okay. These things are actually not existing in the areas that we're targeting. We will have full connectivity. I've heard the gentleman from Sony talking before about inter-satellite links. We will do that. We have inter-satellite links and our constellation is like a living entity with uh, algorithms designed to manage the network autonomously while in space without any need for any ground stations. I won't go through all of this uh, slide. It's full of uh, things that we've done. I'll just point out a few of them. We have three satellites, three nanosatellites. We call them our three diamonds, red, green, and blue. Currently, as we speak, they are being integrated to the PSLV launcher in Satish Dhawan in India for the next launch. So three weeks from now, give or take, depending on ISRO schedule, we will launch our first three satellites and demonstrate voice, data, instant messaging, machine-to-machine, -machine, Internet of Things, and immediately we'll start to provide commercial services. We are fully insured. Uh, we have signed agreement with Virgin, which I'll talk about in a second. We were very surprised uh, at the end of last year to be awarded the best technology innovation award by Frost & Sullivan. By the way, we're in a very good company because previous winners are companies I'm sure you've heard of like AT&T and uh, Cisco and, and Viasat. If you want to build a constellation of sal satellites, you have to think globally and you have to be a responsible citizen of Earth. There's a lot of regulations and a lot of uh, bureaucracy and space treaties that you have to adhere to. We have done that from day one. Our satellites are licensed, are insured. We follow all of the rules and regulations set by NASA and uh, ESA for our satellites. We are fully insured. We have an agreement with JSPOC, the American uh, monitoring agency for satellites to track our orbits and to give us early warnings. And what you can see here in the movie is what does it look like from one of our satellites, again, 200 of them in five different orbital planes. So it's, it's very complicated, but it's something that you have to do. Um, Virgin Orbit is a company based in the U.S., formerly known as Virgin Galactic. We signed an agreement with Virgin to launch uh, our satellites because they have a very agile and a very flexible way of launching satellites using an airplane, a 747 with a big rocket on, on the wing, on the left wing, um, to equatorial orbits. By the way, Virgin will also be our customer because we can provide airplanes 
with the possibility to communicate to the ground no matter where they are. Um, I won't go in detail into that. I'll just say that our business model is very flexible, multiple revenue streams. Uh, that's why, and as I've said, we're a listed company. You can look at what we're publishing to the general public in Australia and the world, and you can see our uh, expected revenues for the next years, which are quite impressive. Uh, by the way, today, this market of voice, data, machine-to-machine, -machine, Internet of Things, etc., has about the size of five billion uh, US dollars. Um, I'd like to show you, let's see if we can make this thing run. Can you click in the middle over there, just over the movie, so it will start playing? Yes, thank you. This is our 2020 vision, pun intended. What you see here is not an animation, it's an actual uh, satellite toolkit simulation of our 200 satellites in the equatorial orbits, providing 24-7 coverage uh, between 15 latitude north to 15 latitude south. Our schedule for deploying this constellation is starting uh, next year. By the end of 2018, we'll already have our first satellites of the constellation, and by 2020, hence the 2020 vision, we will have the full constellation up and running for the people living there. Three weeks from launch, give or take, hopefully less than that, and you can see the actual size of the satellites. You can see uh, me holding it with uh, the other two partners in the company as they were integrated um, just a few weeks ago, and as I've said today, they are uh, in India, just waiting to launch. We're a listed company, and I have a minute before I have to finish and wrap it up. Uh, fortunately for us, we went in a year, by the way, we celebrated just a few days ago uh, our first year of trading. Not a lot of new space companies are traded as a listed company. We are one of them. Uh, we started with a market cap of around $30 million. Today we're traded around $370 million and hopefully uh, our shareholders are, are happy and we are happy and we're full steam ahead for um, our constellation up and running. Um, as I've said, new space technology, and this is what this panel is about, small satellites and new space technology allows you to provide services at a fraction of the cost you could do that just a few years ago. So if you compare $150 million total required capital for a company like ours to, let's say, um, existing services which are by the billions, you can understand where am I going. With that. And with that, I'll wrap it up. Just remember, when you're talking about space, the sky is always the lower limit, so do not limit your imagination. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer questions from the panel and later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next presentation is from Mr. Yuya Nakamura, founder and CEO of Axel Space. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Yuya Nakamura, uh, the president and CEO of Exospace. Um, I myself uh, was an engineer when I was a university student, and I got involved in three nanosatellite, nanosatellite projects. And we developed the world's first CubeSat and launched in 2003. And after uh, graduating from the school, I wanted to continue uh, the microsatellite development as my business, so uh, we started the company with my uh, colleagues. And so this is the actual space. So let me start. Uh, so this is our latest uh, microsatellite. This, uh, this is for the private company. So um, we founded the company in 2008, and we have developed three satellites so far. And yes, we've got a customer. It's Weather News. Maybe some of you have, some of you have installed the uh, application on your smartphone. Um, but um, we we de we developed a satellite not for weather forecast, but for um, ice monitoring. You know, due to the global warming, ice in that uh, Arctic area is melting rapidly. So um, many shipping companies are eager to use this Arctic Ocean as a new shipping route. Um, but it's, you know, uh, I, why they want to use this route is 
let's uh, look at this slide. Um, if you, if they use the Arctic Ocean as a new shipping route, they can uh, shorten the voyage distance uh, down to two thirds of the conventional route, which saves the uh, fuel cost drastically. But you know, it's very dangerous without any safety information when sailing this area. So they need to know ice distribution. So Weather News is trying to provide such kind of you know, uh, navigation services to shipping companies. So this is our first project. And so as I said earlier, we have developed three satellites and two of them are already in orbit. The first one was launched in 2013. And second one, uh, which is called Hodoyoshi One, uh, it's a little bit strange name, uh, uh, was launched in 2014. The second one is kind of an experimental satellite. Uh, we developed this satellite together with the University of Tokyo. And this is a uh, remote sensing satellite. Uh, I'll show you some photos taken by this satellite later. And the third one is again uh, the private satellite for Weather News. And we are launching this uh, satellite next month. Now this satellite is in Russia. We're using the Soyuz rocket to launch uh, this satellite. And this, is, this satellite is an, kind of an upgraded, burden, uh, up upgraded version of the first satellite. Uh, the mission is uh, added something. Uh, I mean, the, this satellite is monitoring the icebergs and volcanoes and typhoons. So they want to monitor uh, various, you know, uh, the object from space. And so let me show you some photos taken by our Hodoyoshi One satellite. Uh, we have taken more than, um, how can I say, this? maybe 3,000 photos so far uh, since the launch uh, two, uh, two years ago. And ground resolution is about uh, seven meters. So it's not so good, but this is kind of an experimental satellite, so we can use it freely. So we are doing many experiment, experiments with our uh, potential customers. So um, you can see those images from our website, so uh, please check uh, it, because we are updating images every week. And we are doing some uh, funny things about this Hodoyoshi One satellite. We are not taking only the Earth's surface, for example. Uh, this is the a photo of the moon. Uh, it's a little bit difficult because we're uh, in Hodoyoshi One satellite. We are adopting the uh, scanning system to take a photo. So uh, you need to, uh, when you want to take a photo of the moon, you need to scan the moon while the satellite is moving so far, seven to, or to eight kilometers per second. So uh, this is funny, but it's not for just for fun because we are trying to use this type of photo, a moon photo, as a calibration. Uh, of the images in the near future. And another uh, interesting photo is this. We took this photo a week, uh, just a week ago, and you know what? This is the International Space Station, and the ISS uh, you know, uh, came just you know, under our sat uh, under Earth satellite, and the relative speed is about 40,000 kilometers per hour, so it's so difficult to take a photo of the ISS from our satellite, but we did it. And you know, our team was so happy to see the images from uh, the image of this you know, ISS from our satellite. And uh, I want to introduce some you know, uh, operation system. You know, uh, many people um, imagine that uh, when operating the satellite, there are so many people and so many screens in the room, but we don't have any screens and no uh, human interaction is required. So all, all the operation uh, activities are you know, fully autonomous. Uh, what uh, we do is that the, uh, we click the point we want to take a photo and wait a week, and the, those images are you know, downloaded, and you can uh, see the photos from this, our website. So it's fully autonomous, and it's necessary to construct a constellation. So uh, we focused on um, developing this type of system for uh, a year uh, when making a Hodoyoshi One satellite. And I should mention this, uh, now we are working with JAXA uh, about make, uh, developing the, their satellite. It's an innovative technology demonstration satellite. So it's, it's like a, a tech demo set. Um, you know, we're developing bus system that's of this satellite and many uh, the companies, research institutes, and universities are developing some kind of component, components or mission instrument. We're 
uh, installing those you know, uh, hardware into our uh, satellite, and we are uh, launching that, that and we are you know, helping operation as well. And we are launching this satellite uh, next year using the Japanese Ypsilon rocket. And you know, uh, this is the first time for JAXA to work with the startup company to make their satellite. So I think it's an epoch, epoch making uh, for in the, in the Japanese you know, uh, space activities. So uh, two years ago, uh, we raised 70 million US dollars to start a new initiative. And we are now making a satellite called GRUS, which weighs just um, 100 kilogram. And with this GRUS satellite, we started a new project uh, called Axelrobe. You know, th this is again the Earth observation satellite, but the ground resolution is has been improved uh, much better you know, uh, than the Hodoyoshi-1 satellite. The ground res resolution is about 2.5 meters so that we can uh, count cars uh, in the parking lot, for example. So we started the Axel Globe. There is a, a short uh, video to uh, describe the Axel Globe project, so uh, please have a look. Okay, so in Axel Globe, we are launching 50 microsatellites in total uh, to, you know, uh, to realize the uh, daily monitoring service you know, of the whole globe. So um, in a nutshell, we're uh, trying to add a new value. I mean, the, we, we want to add time access as a new value in the satellite imagery market. So um, I don't have enough time, so maybe James will uh, explain about the application details. So I skip this, but uh, those uh, imagery can be used in a ver very variety of you know fields like agriculture, forestry, or you know urban planning and others. So uh, we are trying to provide data or images uh, to such kind of you know uh, uh, fields so that we can add values with our satellite imagery. So we are launching the first three satellites at the end of this year. We, and this, is, uh, this launch is fixed, and uh, we start providing the data at the beginning of next year. And we plan to uh, complete the constellation with 50 satellites by the, uh, 2022. OK, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> the next presentation is from Chris McCormick, co-founder and CEO of Planet IQ. Yeah, hi. I forgot my hat from Colorado. Uh, <laughs> keeps the sun off on me. We don't have near as much clouds generally in Colorado that he likes to deal with for his, all his imagery. 
So thanks for uh, inviting me, uh, Ms. Suzu, in ISGS. Um, just a quick introduction for me. Uh, I ran a couple other co companies before, but mostly been in the development of space missions, uh, serial number one, I like to call them, and what's the first time that you ever did uh, certain aspects in space. Uh, and right now we're focusing on weather. Uh, again, it's Chris McCormick. You can get in touch with me there. Uh, wanted to start talking a little bit about the applications from space that is really uh, remote sensing and it's not imagery. Uh, so one of the things that we looked at on the commercial side and not just an experimental side, certainly is remote sensing, uh, discovery, explore, and monitor. Other things that I've done before was some of the outer planets, uh, several different Mars missions, and trying to get uh, new data, new knowledge back to us. And right now we're focusing on, on here. Uh, one thing that we keep on hearing uh, from really the small satellite uh, industry, the CubeSat, and ours is actually a CubeSat too, is that you still need to get the data uh, to feed into the applications, and sometimes the applications want 30 centimeter uh, imagery, some of them want temperatures to a tenth of a degree C. It generally comes down to physics, and what is that aperture of the signals and noise? So uh, that's where we kind of focus on and make sure the physics is going to work to capture the application of the knowledge. Uh, we think the next big uh, focus from a remote sensing characteristic is really the weather. Certainly the weather impacts almost every single industry that's out there. Uh, and if you had better forecasting capabilities, you're actually going to save a lot of people's uh, money, uh, time, lives, and, and uh, be more efficient across, uh, really across the planet. Now one of the things that we don't have that much is the initial conditions of the planet. Uh, we don't have the temperatures, pressures, and we don't have the data all the way to the surface. Uh, that's what we're going to change. Um, right now, on a worldwide scale, uh, the normal type of data is a passive microwave and, and infrared. Uh, the vertical resolutions are not that great. Uh, one of the things you really want to see next to the surface of the planet is where that boundary layer is, and that boundary layer is generally between 500 meters and in, in a couple kilometers. Uh, you just don't see it with, in the microwave because it's integrating way too much of the vertical scale. And microwave really only works over water because it needs a constant background. Uh, and infrared can't see through clouds. So if it's a cloudy day over land, you're not getting space-based data uh, of, of much use. Uh, and the temperature is generally only good to one degree C. So. Uh, so when I like to tell people sometimes we're, we're making the assumptions or guessing what the weather is on the planetary scale right now to guess what it's going to be uh, tomorrow. So we want to have uh, a really finite, uh, finite element model of the entire planet. Right now we do have really decent um, initial conditions at Narita, the Denver airport, certainly you know, most all the different airports. Uh, a nice vertical scale of data with weather balloons, uh, generally twice a day, uh, but also generally over land. And, and the big forcing function of weather on this planet is really the sun-ocean interface. And it's diurnal, day-night, day-night pump. So you need to really be measuring water vapor, you know, certainly the temperature of the water vapor and the location in the vertical scales. Um, now, instead of trying to put weather balloons all over the planet, which is not going to happen, these are going to be launching them all over the oceans, you could do, get the same data set from radio occultation. And uh, we in my previous company had built most of the sensors that are, are flying right now for Cosmic One and Terrasar X and Tandem X and Copsat 5 with the Koreans and Paz with the uh, Spaniards. Um, yeah, we built the Cosmic Two ones. Uh, this is a new company. But you can see on the left, uh, the weather balloon, you have that blue, really fine structure of water vapor. And then the higher you go up, you know, there's, there's really no water up in the, in the stratosphere. Uh, and then the temperature. 
and you get the same kind of uh, soundings on the right from radio occultation. That's a picture of Champ that uh, a friend of ours put in. It looks like it moved around. Um, uh, but we're able to, to get the same kind of data, and we're also measuring the ionosphere, the total electron count, electron density profiles, and the scintillation characteristics that we actually had worked in the past with the University of Kyoto uh, on the ionosphere in particular. Uh, it's got 100 meter resolution in the vertical scale, and the temperature is an order of magnitude better than you generally get from the other space-based uh, remote sensing. Uh, radio occultation, I won't go through this too much. It's really looking at the GPS satellites and the rest of the GNSS satellites rising and setting uh, and measuring the index refraction or actually the bending angle and you're backing out the densities, uh, PV equals NRT, you're backing out the volumes and the temperatures uh, and, and you're picking out the water vapor as well. So. Uh, these are all the things you get. Like I said, temperature is the tenth of a degree C. Uh, we're basically a 6U spacecraft bus with, with a lot of origami on the antennas going out, and our antennas, you can't really see it that well in this, this image. Um, now, the, the big thing, the big race from the science perspective to be able to, to get pristine data into uh, numerical forecast models uh, from all the numerical weather prediction centers is that last three kilometers closest to the ground. There's about 90% of the water vapors in the last three kilometers. Uh, uh, most of the mass is close to Earth. Uh, so you, if you're not measuring, uh, if you're only measuring from, from six or eight or 10 kilometers up, you're measuring where planes fly. Planes fly up there to get out of the weather. So you're not, you're not a weather satellite. So you really need to get down and measure the water vapor because it's the water vapor that holds most of the energy uh, for the, the next wa weather events, for the next days and the next weeks. Um, now, most people were just doing a GPS radio occultation. We're doing all of them. And every single spacecraft that's out there as a source they're slightly different. So you look at the, the short-term and long-term stability of the signal that you're measuring as you're getting occulted and measuring the bending. So we've been doing all this and measuring all the different sources, actually using the, the hydrogen maser there in Boulder, Colorado at the National Institute of Standards. Um, we did an experiment with Cosmic, uh, Cosmic with six satellites uh, with the Taiwanese and the National Science Foundation and JPL in the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. This is about as well as uh, we were able to do uh, 2,400 occultations a day, I think it was. Um, now we want to uh, go to 5,000 occultations per day. We're launching next March. Uh, uh, and then start increasing with, with more satellites up there to get to 15,000 occultations a day. Um, this is better data in, in some ways than, than uh, radio sounds or weather balloons. Uh, in general, water, there's about 700 or 800 weather balloons a day. So, you know, we're getting over orders of magnitude uh, more than that. And then we want to go ahead and really cover the planet and, and have uh, a really tight, finite element model of, of um, the initial state. So when you do forecast and propagate forward, you're, you're able to have much more accurate on the forecasting. Um, now here, yeah, can you go ahead and click that? Now here's is a, a UCAR, the University of Corporate Atmospheric Research, did a simulation on um, Typhoon Nuri. Uh, the one on the left is all the infrared, all the passive microwave, all the data was available to look at this uh, tropical disturbance to see if it'll turn into a typhoon. And, and on the right was the same model, same data with, with the very sparse, I think it's five data points of uh, radio occultation from Cosmic. It was able to pick up the cyclogenesis, the beginning of the spinning. It was able to measure um, water vapor and the energy available to, to start one. And if you had the, the real movie of what really happened, it, it was just like the model. It was able to, to pick out uh, that this tropical depression would turn into a typhoon 
that it would, I think, intensify to like a category two, and, and here's your track. Um, so just with this sparse data set from Cosmic, they were able to go from a 20% chance of getting this right to 60% chance. So you start adding a couple more uh, orders of magnitude, more data that's actually getting down to the surface of the planet, you, you should actually be able to uh, know a typhoon um, uh, would occur many more days in advance than what we're doing right now. So that's just one application. If you know where the typhoons are and you're shipping, you're not going to want to head to the ship right there. You're going to go ahead and plan their route a lot uh, more efficiently to, to go across the Pacific. So I'm, I'm out of time. So anyway, thank you, uh, and he'll tell you more about applications. <laughs> thank you very much. So next is Mr. James Crawford, founder and CEO of Orbital Insight. Thank you very much. So I'm uh, James Crawford from Orbital Insight. So unlike all the other people here, I'm a software guy. I'm originally a PhD in artificial intelligence a um, number of years back. Um, I moved out to Silicon Valley. I didn't move out to Silicon Valley to start a startup. I moved to Silicon Valley because I got a job from NASA at, at the Ames Research Center as head of autonomy and robotics. And uh, we did some really exciting work on building some of the ground planning software for autonomous plant generation for the Mars rovers and a lot of other projects. But eventually, I got, I got an offer from over at Google that I couldn't turn down. I got an offer from the Google guys to lead the Google Books project where we were scanning all the world's books, which was, we scanned the 20 millionth book when I was running the project. And what we did essentially was to take a picture of every page of 20 million books, and then we would use AI to figure out what the words were, and then we would use Google ranking relevance. So if you type a quote from a book, you'd get that page from that book as your Google search result. And it occurred to me about three years ago, just slightly over three years ago, that there's getting to be a lot of satellites. And that was very clear from the uh, intro uh, slides for this, for this session. Um, we did a back of the envelope calculation that if you wanted to look at all the images coming down from all the satellites that are being launched by all the established companies and startups, you would need 8 million people doing nothing all day every day but looking at satellite imagery. And satellites are important, understanding the Earth's important, but it's unlikely we're going to have the entire population of New York City staring at our satellite images to figure out what they mean. So we set out on a project to build an AI system capable of processing imagery at that scale and understanding the Earth. So we're a very mission-driven company. Our, <clears throat> our mission is to understand the Earth, and we do that by using satellites. And, and we're, we're, we're very broad in our thinking about this, so we use big satellites as the Digital Globe satellite. We use the smaller satellites like the Axel Space, or the, in this case, the Planet satellites. Um, and we also use another kind of new hardware um, because if you just have satellite images, as I say, you really need AI and, and deep learning to make sense of the images. It turns out that you can use the same hardware. This is a, a GPU. The same hardware that was built for doing um, first-person shooter video games. So, so GPUs were designed for video games so that you could very rapidly generate the screens in your, in your video games. But Basically, what the AI people figured out how to do about starting about five years ago was to essentially run these GPUs backwards and use them to interpret images. So what we really do is we take satellite imagery, we run them through GPUs that are trained to um, find objects and count objects. So those objects could be buildings, trucks, uh, railways to find railway cars, separate out land use, find oil tanks, compute the amount of oil in the oil tanks by looking at the shadows, find ships find houses, find airplanes. So what this lets us do is essentially compute the economic pulse of the planet. And, and we say our, our mission is to understand what we're doing on the Earth and what we're doing to the Earth. I'm going to talk about a couple of quick examples. And, and I should say before I go into that, it, it, hopefully it's clear, we don't own any satellites, we don't fly any satellites, but we use everybody's imagery. So we have contracts with all the major satellite companies to pull their imagery into our system. And then, and then when we sell an application like I'm about to describe, we give some of the money back to the satellite companies. So one application <clears throat> we've been doing is tracking the people shopping in the United States. So as you probably know, in the United States, if somebody wants to go somewhere, they pretty much always drive. The only exception is big cities like Manhattan and, and Chicago, but other than that, people drive everywhere they're going. So one easy way to find out how many people are shopping is to look at the number of cars in the parking lot. 
So we're now tracking over 200,000 parking lots at, at 100 different retail chains. We've counted more than 3 billion cars across all of those parking lots, and that's using imagery from multiple satellite providers. We can see the seasonal patterns. We can see people shopping right before Christmas. Um, we can see things, even smaller holidays like Valentine's Day. We can track which retailers are doing well and which retailers are about to close a lot of their stores. We're selling to a bunch of hedge funds and mutual funds who use this data to decide where to make stock market investments. Um, folks like JP Morgan are now using our data in some of their reports to analyze what's going on in, in US retail. Um, but that's only one of the things you can do, and one of the exciting things about this area is that once you have a really good car counting algorithm, you can do other things with it. In this case, we did a pattern of life in Nanjing, China. Um, we took all of the digital globe imagery for five years, and then we <coughs> filtered it down to just the roads using um, uh, maps derived from OpenStreetMaps. Um, and then we counted cars on the roads, and you can see in 2009, most of the traffic's in the center of the city, and then over time, it spreads out. And we've been doing similar work on about a dozen different U.S. cities um, to establish an idea of how much gasoline usage is happening, to help folks who are trying to figure out how to place billboards, to help folks that are trying to understand where to site new retail stores. There's all kinds of applications of this once you have it. Um, and you can do the same thing. For instance, to understand refugee behavior by looking at car counts at border crossings. Um, for some of our government customers, you'd look at car counts at other kinds of installations. Um, but, but it's a very interesting how you can take one computer vision application, car counting, and then use it across five or six different um, application verticals. One other area we've been looking at is world oil storage. Um, we have now found all of the 25,000 oil tanks around the world. Um, it turns out they weren't all known. Um, if you look at folks like uh, Bloomberg or Thomson Reuters, they'll give you a list, if you're a subscriber, they'll give you a list of where they think, they think all the oil tanks are. We actually trained a neural network to find oil tanks, um, ingested all the imagery of all of China, um, and we found enough new oil tanks, new in the sense that they weren't known by the oil trading community, to hold about 200 million barrels of oil. And we're now tracking all of those oil tanks. So we have the first real objective measure of oil storage in China, both the capacity as well as the current storage. And again, this is the kind of application that we will use digital globe imagery, Airbus imagery, planet imagery. Once Axel Space is flying, we'll use Axel Space imagery, right? So, so um, pretty much any satellite imagery can be used. And it's important to do that because we really want, ideally, we would get every one of these oil tanks every day. And, and every time you add more imagery, the signal gets better and it becomes more valuable to the energy companies and the trading companies. We've also been looking at um, a dozen plus other kinds of applications. Um, one of the projects we've been doing is with the World Bank, looking at poverty. It turns out in the places in the world where poverty is, most of, is the biggest problem is where the data is the worst. So we've been looking at agricultural productivity, car density, building density, building height. And our colleagues at the World Bank have been looking at how they can correlate that with poverty. And, and we looked specifically across Sri Lanka, measured all of, these, all of these quantities. And it turned out that car density, building density, building height were, if you put them together, created a, a pretty good correlate for poverty, which is good because currently the World Bank can only study a place like Sri Lanka. They, they do a survey once every 10 years send people out, you know, have them look at each house, you know, compute poverty. And by doing this, of course, you could potentially get poverty maps, you know, up to, up to weeks, you know, weeks apart or less. Um, we have a lot of other applications. I'm not going to try to go through them all, but the other one that's really kind of interesting is agricultural yield. Um, people have been looking for a while at agricultural yield in places like the U.S., um, by using NDVI, which is a satellite-derived measure of, of crop health. Um, we've shown that we can also push that out into places like Sri Lanka, into places like Brazil. So we've now done about a half dozen different countries in the world, some of which are, are, are not normally studied for various, and we've done this for different customers of ours that care about different parts of the world. So we can now, as we need to, we can roll this out for different places and get in a good idea of food security, as well as the economic indicators based on agricultural yield. So the ultimate vision of what we're doing is really to track all parts of the, what we call the, the sort of economic pulse of the planet. So everything from mining activity 
um, iron ore storage. In this case, this is the this is the automotive supply chain, uh, mining, automotive, uh, iron ore storage, steel refining, which we can actually see using um, the right kinds of thermal thermal bands, um, car production, import export, and then car sales. And you can imagine doing the same kind of tracking across all the different supply chains, um, all the different parts of the world economy, and understand and understanding then in near real time which economies in which countries are growing, which ones are not doing as well, which ones are accelerating, which ones are decelerating. And this ultimately gives insights for governments, for investors, for insurance companies, and for Fortune 500 companies that are trying to manage all of their own operations in the context of everything going on in the supply chains that they're part of. Thank you. Thank you very much. So next is from Mr. Naruo Kanemoto, founder and CEO of SpaceShift. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm a CEO of the SpaceShift. Um, I came from the, as uh, James, like James, I came from the ICT industry, and uh, I started my career in the ICT industry in uh, 1996. But um, I started my company uh, eight years ago because I I love the space. So, uh, is it quicker? <laughs> yeah. so uh, so the, uh, this is the picture. I love it. And um, I just started my company because I love the space things. And uh, uh, I'm now hesitating to start my presentation because of uh, the other guy to talk about the, everything about the um, data utilization things, but um, I anyway I started. So I uh, there's some um, some achievement of my company. So we did the space, some space events uh, for one or two years, and uh, yeah, like this it's um, gathering the, all the people around the space lovers and the music lovers. Get it together, and uh, some the uh, famous cartoonist in on a stage with the Jacks guy. So that's a very fantastic, but uh, making uh, not so much money. So and uh, this is space content, and uh, we are now uh, the selling that the fairing of the H2B rocket, and you can buy this the, out there. There is a space store there, so. Yeah, uh, you, you can buy it and, and uh, you can have my company. And um, yeah, <laughs> this is a toy for the kids and uh, yeah, cultivating the dream of the, for the space. So, and the next one is the space um, signage. It's, uh, it, it's um, uh, the project was uh, University of Tokyo and um, the advertising agency is selling the uh, this space is uh, it, this is uh, inside of the satellite, and uh, they take the picture uh, the, towards the outside of the satellite, and then you can show you a lo company logo with the actual uh, imagery. So yeah, this sounds cool. And um, yeah, and uh, also uh, we are uh, supporting uh, some company. So now the Canon Electronics is the subsidiary company of the Canon. It's a camera company. Uh, will launch the satellite uh, this June, and um, their actual commercial camera inside of the satellite and they capture the one meter ground resolution imagery. So that's um, exciting. So now we are shifting into um, this new business is the processing of the satellite data. So this is the supply chain of the satellite data. And uh, there's a launcher and the manufacturer. Um, so we are here the, for processing the data. So the, in the space industry, we are using the very old type of algorithm to process um, imagery or uh, radar data. So we bring the, some new approach to process the existing satellite data. Um, then the, those platform company can utilize that data very easily. And uh, I'm looking at the uh, predictable society, which means uh, those platform company can provide some pr uh, personalized predictions to the users, so we can use that satellite data as um, kind of the more, most macro uh, vision of the Earth. 
So uh, this is a kind of um, uh, recap, but uh, the satellite usage is actually changing uh, with a company like Axel Space. So now the path was the, we are looking at the uh, very specific point to, uh, to know about that um, specific area. But then now we have um, hundreds of satellites on, on the orbit and the, uh, the system just automatically uh, the process the data and we get the information out of that. So and then the system itself detects the unexpected changes. So we can find something different from, from normal. So we can send some drone there and uh, that we can send the people there. So we can use the satellite constellation as the uh, sensor uh, of the uh, uh, ground changes. So now, it's, uh, yeah, it's the same story here. So it's the time to combine the space and the ITC, ICT technology. And uh, we have the big data from the space. And uh, we have unlimited computing power on the cloud. And uh, we reinventing the AI. Uh, actually, I was studying the AI in my bachelor project. So that's everything we get it together. Um, to understand that the correlation of the everything on the Earth and um, space data. So yeah, this is <laughs> already talking about that. So I think no uh, instruction on that. So there's some um, uh, existing the change detection technology. So but uh, we are trying to um, uh, revolutional revolutionize the satellite uh, data, especially for the star radar data. So now looking at the radar, the, with the optical satellite, we just can see uh, with the sunlight. So we cannot see through the clouds and in, in night. But the radar is um, uh, that's seeing the uh, object with a microwave, so that can see through the clouds and even in night. So we can get the uh, continuous data from the ground. The continuity is a um, very important part of the uh, working with uh, satellite data. So the, now we don't have not so much uh, numbers of the radar satellite, but um, these are coming up radar sats from the world. So th these are um, very small and uh, very cheap uh, satellite is coming up in these uh, two or uh, three years. So we can utilize these satellites just like an optical satellite. And um, as you know, the radar data is very difficult. It's, it's very difficult for human. And uh, you can see the noise, but um, we, we just, the human, uh, can see that as a noise. But um, the processing makes that imagery. But the imagery is for human. So if uh, well, if the computer directly analyzes that uh, noise itself, that we can detect uh, smaller changes like this. So we have the approach to change the way to analyze the satellite data uh, to see the more uh, smaller uh, changes on the ground. So the, if it's uh, achieved with that radar satellite, that the con Continuity of the data is um, secured, and uh, if we can have the type of technology to detect the very small changes in a very um, big uh, swash, and uh, that can change the uh, change detections. So, the yeah, the, this is some our action items uh, to achieve this. So. The most important thing is the data fusion with um, uh, information from the satellite data. So satellite, the data based on the satellite is uh, not um, uh, only things to know about the change on the ground. So we have to work on that how we can uh, combine uh, fusion with uh, ground-based data the like um, IoT or the cyberspace or other things. So 
we, we have a lot of challenges, but um, yeah, uh, this is a, one of the key tools to understand what's uh, uh, going on on the ground. So, um, yeah, this is um, kind of, yeah, this is talking again, but um, already James talked about that, yeah. But, uh, yeah, th these um, information from the satellite data can indicate the changes uh, economically and um, economical changes. So that if we can see the, all the small changes on the ground, we can know that something different on, is happening on the ground. So, yeah, that's some kind of uh, key tool for everyone, I think, for every uh, business and uh, for every individual. So uh, I want to be the, um, the game changer of the utilization of the satellite data. Thank you. Thank you very much. The last presentation is from Mr. Masayuki Minato, Investment Manager, Guri Ventures. Thank you so much. Um, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Masayuki Minato. Um, a quick introduce, uh, self introduction of myself. Um, I'm a venture capitalist of the Guri Ventures, where I, uh, I focus on their B2B and enterprise solution, and also frontier tech like uh, space tech and uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, prior to the RBC world, I worked for the Boston Consulting Group, uh, where I was, I was engaged in um, um, aerospace uh, industry, uh, transformation uh, project in the, for the aerospace industry, where I got there interested in um, aerospace. And today, I'd like to talk about uh, emergence of their Japanese space tech uh, from investors' perspective. Um, I think there are several overlap from their gentleman's presentation, but um, I'd like to talk about from their investor side. Um, I think that some of, you are, some of you are not familiar with uh, venture capital, so let me talk a bit about how the, how the venture capital works. So uh, venture capital is, uh, in a nutshell, is a funds that empowers uh, fast-growing startups. So we raise uh, money from the institutional uh, investors and the individual investors, like bank, and the finance startups with high growth potential and uh, adding value to, the, to them through the active participation, such as uh, management support and uh, hiring best people, something like that. And we make money uh, by the exit event like uh, M&A and IPO. Uh, this is a brief introduction of their, how the venture capital works. So how does the uh, VC investment trend in Japan looks like? Uh, as you can see in the picture, uh, you can see how uh, fast growing the, the uh, in domestic investment in the VC uh, in Japan. And uh, I want to draw your attention this, to this slide. Um, this slide shows the VC investment as a percentage of the GDP. As you can see, our, uh, Japan is underpenetrated relative to the US, so uh, there is a huge uh, um, growth potential for the VC investment here in Japan. And now take a look at the our investment trend here in Japan, especially the B2B space, because our space tech is basically the B2B. So early 2000, um, their on-premise, uh, the enterprise software was a trend, and uh, after Amazon launched their AWS business in 2008, uh, general cloud business has spread out in, the, um, in Japan like a software as a service. However, uh, at this stage, uh, the, these services only limited to the like uh, white color works, like sales and uh, advertisement, uh, like uh, human resources. However, um, in a couple of years, things have been changed. Um, 
uh, as you can see here, uh, like uh, hardware uh, technology and the software, software technology, such as artificial intelligence and the IoT emerging in the market. So, and also space tech also emerged in, the, in Japan. So uh, the digitization has expanded to the uh, more blue color or more old traditional uh, industry like uh, agriculture or uh, logistics. Um, let me show you one example from Japan. Um, there is a, a one startup called Umitron. Uh, the Umitron provides a solution, uh, space tech solution to the uh, fish farming industry. Um, fish farming industry has a uh, three big problem right now. Number one is a uh, cost increase in fish feed, as you can see in the chart. And the second one is the our uh, uh, feeding level is and manage, as you can imagine, um, fish farmers are at their feet on, based on their experience. So there's no basis on the scientific basis uh, to feeding the fish. As a result, um, fish feeding costs consists of over 60% of the, their total cost. And finally, there is a, a huge uh, fine, uh, business risk from the red tide. So one guy uh, who is a, our ex JAXA engineer uh, come up, came up with the idea uh, for the, this uh, solution. Uh, actually, the, he is uh, one of my old friends from college. And uh, uh, he run, uh, founded the Umitron. And uh, let me explain the how, uh, what is the Umitron's approach. So first, Umitron uh, collects the data from satellite and the sensor data from IoT um, to, um, to monitor the movement in the sea and the fishes. And uh, um, such data are uh, analyzed using the deep learning to optimize their um, feeding frequency, timing, and the volume. And the fisher, uh, uh, for, uh, farm fishers uh, can uh, control the feeding uh, by using mobile application. So that kind of the uh, space tech application can be applicable to the many other industries as the gentleman explained. So here in Japan, uh, VC investment in space tech also growing uh, since 2015. Um, major uh, space tech deals is a, our Access Space is around in 2015, uh, the Nakamura Science Company. And also there, uh, in 2016, um, AstroScale uh, has completed a, a big round in the finance. So why uh, space tech is getting attention from their investors? Uh, we investors typically are look into four elements to assess our attractiveness of market. Uh, first, at the market size, uh, as the gentleman explained, uh, space tech can be uh, applicable for the many various industries. Number two is uh, pain points. Uh, as you know, uh, here in Japan, there are huge inefficiency in the work and the challenges that can, uh, space can take, uh, can address. And then number three are trends. As you know, uh, last year, government uh, passed the commercial space law. And uh, also, uh, government started to support uh, space tech companies financially. And uh, also, there is uh, another trend, um, availability of a key technology for the star, uh, space tech, like crowd and the AI and the IoT. And the final thing is the business viability. Uh, in fact, our uh, business viability uh, aspect is still uncertain, but the, I think it's going to be viable uh, because um, uh, the hardware and the software costs uh, is getting lower and also uh, uh, easier data access coming from the planned launch in the small satellites. So uh, this is the last slide from my side, uh, what we are looking for. 
So Japanese BCs envision the uh, space tech ecosystems through the three pillars. These three are key to uh, expand the space tech ecosystem here in Japan. The number one is the people. Uh, we need more space researchers and uh, engineers to jump in the uh, startup world. And number two is a collaboration. As uh, Nero uh, explained, um, space, space, space tech is uh, one of the key element to uh, digitalizing the old economy. However, uh, they need uh, computer science and also uh, industrial knowledge to make a, um, develop the, the tangible solution for the industries. Uh, and the, finally, the money. Uh, this, uh, so, as you know, um, space tech is uh, capital intensive and uh, take a long time. So, um, as an investor, uh, we need to uh, make more risk money. So this is my part of my job. And uh, um, so in order to do, do that, um, um, we need to make a performance for the, our investors and uh, shift to money to the space tech. So these three are, pieces are the necessary to expand the space tech ecosystem here in Japan. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we will move to the discussion on the small start business for about 30 minutes. I will show the chart of the key of the business elements here. I will ask you several questions, including the questions from SpaceTube. So far, all of them, all of you. And which is the most important? Ideas, engineering, or sales for space venture companies? If you have other elements, please let us know and explain. Well, I think if, if I look at, at this slide and you're asking which is the most important, it's very difficult to say. It is highly dependent on the type of business you would like to, to develop. If, if, you, if you try to build a very innovative satellite with uh, uh, very um, advanced technology component, so probably without the technology you have no business. If you're trying to rely on existing technology but you need access to the market, so probably the most important thing is, is marketing and sales, and uh, you always need good ideas. So it's, it's really dependent on, on the actual um, um, component of, of your business. But uh, I would like to say a few words about the disruptive nature of what happens today with with the new space. And I can give you a simple example just uh, referring to the last uh, speaker's presentation about investments in space companies. So just 10 years ago, you uh, needed uh, billions of dollars um, to invest in a new space venture, whatever that may be. Uh, then we've transformed towards what we call today new space. Uh, I'm sure you all heard about uh, a major investment in a company called OneWeb through a Japanese super fund from a SoftBank, over $1 billion. So this is the, the size of the investment required for a space company. But today, when we are talking about small satellites, so the required investment is, is much lower. And this is due to the technology that has moved forward, miniaturization, we can do better things with smaller and smaller satellites. The markets. Earth is going through globalization, economy is changing throughout the globe, it opens up new markets. And for each of the speakers here who talked about his own company, and of course for Sky and Space Global, uh, the entire Earth is, is our market. So that opens up as well. Management, people are not afraid. People, uh, we, we are connected throughout the world and we hear about success stories. Uh, and you can find good management and, and use it within your company. Funding starts to be available, as we've just heard. People are talking about the possibilities of funding and regulation slowly but surely allows new space companies to step into, into uh, that market. Okay. Um, well, I think every aspect is very important for a startup, but uh, for um, technology startup, I would say that technology is 
uh, very important, actually, uh, especially in the uh, the first phase of the company, because it, you know if we don't have the technology, we can't create anything, right? So um, at first, we should have some uh, technology, very unique technology to the company. And after we build the technology, and I think uh, we can get some investment from uh, the uh, venture capital firms or other you know, business enterprises. And you know, uh, we experienced Series A fundraising, but I think you know, um, they, uh, it, it was successful because of uh, the technology. We, we have launched two satellites so far, and we, we proved the, our technology. And so maybe the next step would be the business development, how we can you know, make money through our technology. So I think you know, it depends on the stage of the company. So uh, the first technology and second would be uh, the, the business development. And of course, the other aspect is related to, to every, you know, um, uh, related to each other. So I think, you know, uh, what we, I, I think it depends on the company, how we, uh, how we you know, expand. So in our case, the first technology, the second, the business development. Thank you. So how about you? I'm going I'm I'm to disagree a little bit. It's mostly what is the application you're trying to do? What are you doing? Uh, and how, who are you going to sell it to? Uh, even if you assume the spacecraft is free and the launch is free, what is that service, if it's a telecommunication service or a weather service in, in our case, and, and, um, yeah, or any analytics, who's going to be buying this service, this, this new knowledge that you're creating? So you got to have that business plan of who your customers are and, and how you're going to bring in money. Uh, then I'm big in physics, so you want to make sure the technology that you're bringing to bear actually uh, collects that kind of data that you could bring into the products you could sell. So uh, in space, most of us are, are, are technologists to begin with because you almost have to be uh, to be able to uh, turn that, that sensor data into something that's marketable. Uh, and then without funding, funding uh, money is a tool. Without you know proper amount of tools, you're not going to really make this happen either. So you, you actually need all of these things, but you know without the the good idea that you could turn into a marketable products, it doesn't matter how good your technology is. So you really you need to make sure that there's customers out there, and sometimes you're a part of creating a whole new industry, and that's you know uh, an excellent uh, position to be in. So you know the market's going to be there, but you have to also develop it. Thank you. So we've spent a lot of time talking to venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, and it's kind of interesting. We always go in ready to talk about technology, and they always want to talk about markets. Um, and, and, I, and I think they have a good reason for it, because when you look at the, the companies that have succeeded and failed in, in, in the startup world, the ones that have failed have almost never failed because of technology. You, you almost never see a company that, that went bankrupt because they didn't, because the, rock, you know, the rocket blew up or the whatever it was, the widget they were trying to build you know, fell off the table or whatever. But, but the number of companies that have failed because they brought something to market and nobody would actually buy it once they spent all the money to bring it to market is almost all the failures. So I think, I think I kind of agree with Chris. I think the technology has to work. You have to have a technology that doesn't violate the laws of physics. You have to have some plausibility argument that you've got a hope of building it. And then after that, you focus on making sure you're um, addressing a large market and uh, making sure that you have a market that, you know, within a reasonable period of time will actually buy your product. Thank you. Kanimoto-san. Yeah, I agree with the guys and uh, that everything's very really, uh, important for uh, the startups and uh, all the company and the business. But uh, I think that two points is missing here. So one is um, timing, so which means the technologies, now we have the most role in, in space, so we can make the everything possible. Um, the markets uh, have to understand what the space business is, and um, the management, we need a lot of people help um, interest in, in the space business. So the one is the timing. So other thing is action. So anyhow, 
we have the idea or technology and then found the market. But uh, no, if we don't make the, any action after that, nothing happened. So the timing and the action is a very important key part of the driver for this market. Thank you. So Minato-san. Thank you. Um, I'm an um, um, investor for the seed and uh, early stage startups. So I have to say our uh, technology is uh, the most challenging part for the Japanese uh, space tech companies because, uh, as I mentioned, um, their limited um, availability of the uh, space um, engineers from the space industry. And also, uh, uh, we need uh, like a, a data scientist and an um, artificial intelligence engineer. However, the, um, compared to the US, the availability of those uh, engineering talent is uh, uh, really challenging here in Japan. So they're in the beginning of their uh, uh, um, uh, space tech startups, uh, the technology side is the most challenging part, I think. Thank you very much. So from here, any order is okay to answer. So next one is a, a question is about market. For the small industry, which applications are key? Which will bridge markets to other industries? Sure. Um, so, you know, I think I think that was also sort of put in the in the initial slides. I mean, there's a huge bet being placed by OneWeb and others, um, OneWeb, Facebook, Elon Musk, on on using small sats for communication. Um, and so, I think that's probably number one. And then number two, I think is is the whole area of remote sensing, um, broadly construed, as we were discussing, so a couple of us were discussing earlier, of of being able to understand what's going on on the Earth and everything visible on the Earth. I think those are probably number one and number two for small set applications right now. Anyone else about market? Oh. Yes, I, I uh, I'm happy to to agree. Since uh, we're building a communication infrastructure in space, <laughs> there's. Almost everything you would like to do, every uh, economic sector requires the possibility to transfer data from one place to another. People are talking about billions, maybe trillions of Internet of Things devices coming up within, within the uh, foreseeable future. And all of this data has to go somehow from one place uh, to another. So I believe the driving force behind the economic development in the space sector will be communication services. Uh, and of course, that is one of the reasons why we have built our company exactly based on, on this specific technology and, and uh, sector. Anyone else? No? So the data from space and um, uh, accessible space is bringing the uh, global eye to the everyone to see the every small changes on the ground. So this means um, uh, this can bro bring the modeling to predict the, the society itself. And um, uh, now we are driving with the commercial um, activity, but um, uh, with those um, big data and um, data from the space can enable uh, to predict uh, every single um, things on the ground, and uh, it, it makes a um, uh, different economy. So I mean, the market is uh, the market itself, and um, the, now with James is working on that. And uh, sometime in in near future, that you that Jamie will find a uh, new way of kind of the prediction of of the uh, world. Uh, uh, industrial chain, a supply chain like that. So, the, um, the this space data and um, this space data is enabled by the space access and um, con uh, the communications in everywhere. So, yeah, that makes a 
a big change in the world, and uh, yeah, we will have a big change because of that uh, space utilization. Okay. So the next question. The third question is about funding. How will the capital investment market support your small start business? And how long will it take for your business to generate a positive return on investment? I'm willing to yeah, hear this answer. <laughs> but the, um, um, of course, it's up to the, the what kind of the services you are going to provide. Uh, however, I think you are. Uh, it will take like uh, five to ten years. Uh, maybe the uh, take a long term in uh, from the investor perspective, but I think it's in, um, um, it's going to be viable in this time frame. I think. Well, for for our perspective. Um, we should be cash positive with the first couple spacecraft. There's several uh, data buy um, offers right now from the U.S. government. We have to deal with the World Meteorological Organization, Policy 40 for a data sharing, but those terms and conditions are being worked out. There's a uh, NOAA uh, RFP that's out right now, a request for a proposal. Uh, draft version that we're working with them right now. The, the U.S. Air Force is coming out with one, but we're also uh, working through with David Grimes at the head of the World Meteorological Organization to see how the data sharing is going to happen. But uh, still, there's the Japanese meteorological agencies, the ECMWF, the European centers, um, just are all across the board in terms of how they could get all this data into the various numerical weather prediction centers. Um, but, you know, we're trying to price out and, you know, certainly keep our costs really low and price out just the raw data, much like Digital Globe uh, sold raw data, raw imaging to the, the NEMA at the beginning, but the National Geo uh, Spatial Intelligence Agency in, in the U.S. And then they started branching out more in the analytics and data products and selling to other countries. So we're doing the same thing, uh, raw data uh, from a, a temperature pressure, water vapor, and then start working into specially uh, forecasting uh, work with insurance commodities, agriculture, shipping, uh, and the rest of it. So. We, we see a, a quicker turnaround, one, because our, our costs are a lot, generally a little bit cheaper than the imaging uh, spacecraft markets. So um, you said five to ten years. You're not invested in sky and space, unfortunately. Well, maybe, maybe you should. <laughs> uh, I think it will be a lot faster than that. As I've said, we will have our first three satellites in, in three weeks from now up in space. Um, in orbit testing over a few weeks and the revenue making immediately after that. So within two to three months, we will begin to uh, generate revenues out of these three satellites. Now, remember I've said we're launching 200 satellites for an equatorial constellation with launches starting at the end of 2018, ramping up this constellation during 2019 with a full up and running 24-7 service at 2020. Um, now, that means that by 2019, we're expecting revenues of uh, uh, tens up to hundreds of millions of dollars per year. This is not just uh, um, fantasy or imaginative figures. This is based on hard facts, on the fact that there are three billion people living in the equatorial region currently unable to use satellite communication services because they are just too expensive. And the minute we come along with an affordable way of using satellite communication, uh, just imagine what will that do out of these three billion potential customers, excluding, of course, of course corporates, government, uh, global companies, uh, shipping lines, airliners, machine-to-machine -machine services, Internet of Things services, put all of that together and you're, you can expect uh, very significant revenues in a very short period of time. And by the way, I think that that's a part of new, what new space is all about. You're building your satellites very, very quickly. 
you're testing the technology in space very quickly and you can begin to get revenues um, at a very, very high rate. There's no need to develop the satellite for five to six years. You're using nanosatellites technology, you can do it faster than that. If, if you have the technology, and with this I agree with my colleagues here, if you have the technological capability into your company, if you have the expertise, if you have the know-how, you can build a very successful business model and you can expect revenues within a very small amount of years. So I believe five to ten years is a very pessimistic estimation. This is probably what we are used to, and, and you're right, this is what we are used to in uh, the existing space companies. But this is changing. Look at uh, uh, companies uh, today uh, and look what the near future foresees for us and I think you, we will see it a lot faster than that. Uh, it doesn't have to be billions of dollars in revenues. It just has to be something that helps you build the business. And as I've said, for us, fortunately, uh, the future seems to be very, very, very bright. Okay. So, next question is about partnership and collaborations. What kind of possible partnership can space venture companies have with established big companies? And what is the potential for a partnership in Japan? This is one of the examples of OneWave. They have not only this partnership, but also um, MDA, Canadian companies, and even Coca-Cola, and investment partner from Japan. So, anyway, about partnership and collaboration. Yeah, so, um, we, we are really excited about some of the local partnerships. We actually um, recently closed our C round, um, which was led out of, by Sequoia Capital out of Silicon Valley, but we also included both Geodesic and Otochu out of Japan, both joined that round as, as investors in Orbital Insight. And I think there's some really exciting collaborations here in the Japanese market um, uh, with, with all kinds of companies, with companies that are doing insurance, with companies that are working with the uh, um, Jap Japanese MOD and with companies that are trying to find ways to use satellite analytics to improve the functioning of their supply chains. Um, more generally, um, I think one of the interesting things about being in the analytics market is that we are fundamentally in the business of partnerships because we don't fly any satellites. So we work with all the satellite companies around the world to get the imagery and then we work with both consulting companies as well as customers and partners and implementation partners to take the analytics and then um, you know fold it into the eventual users' workflows um, and and you know make it power decision making in the right ways. Thank you very much. Anybody else? I think part of being a space company is that if you have a satellite immediately you're a global company, even if you have only one satellite. It, if you put it at a sun synchronous orbit and the entire world is your market. And partnership, partnerships are one of the main uh, possibilities or the main enablers to fast track your business and to fast track your company. So you should really invest in that uh, globally. Um, we, we have agreements with uh, companies like uh, Virgin Galactic, like uh, SatSpace Africa, like GlobalSat uh, Group, and of course many, many others. Uh, this is a very uh, good way to develop your business and also, if you're building a partnership, you hear from the other professionals about the market, about the technology, they may help you to fine tune your ideas or your strategy. And together, you may even find uh, new ventures or, or new ways of moving forward your business. So you should definitely, as a space startup or as a space company, you should definitely invest in developing your partnerships. Um, I think the, for a space startups, the partnership is very important. In our case, uh, we've got uh, investment from the Mitsui, uh, in Japanese Mitsui Busan, and Sky Perfect JSAT and Weather News, and it's a very strong partnership, and we work together to create a new business and new satellites, so, and they give us some credibility about our business and our company. So um, I think, you know, the uh, more and more partnership will, emerge, uh, will come uh, in this Japanese space industry. And, um, and I, I, I'm, you know, uh, looking for more um, uh, partnership with other companies. And, you know, they have uh, more and more, 
how can I say, the interest in the space business. And I think so. Uh, we want to invite all of you here to enter in this mar into this market to start your own business using st space data. So partnership will uh, make you strong. Thank you very much. I will move to the next question. And this question is one of the most important today. And, and also this question is only for overseas panelists. This is especially important question for space to audience. What do you expect for Japanese aerospace students in the next five to 10 years? Overseas panelists. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Uh, if you look at what happened in, in the world, you'll see that companies like uh, Planet or Spire or Clyde Space or Gomp Space or Sky Space Global for that matter, all of them usually have uh, key personnel within them who were part of uh, either the academy or uh, space companies. So uh, I, would, I would really like to see Japanese students today within a few years, within five to 10 years from now, sitting at this panel while they have their own startup companies. Uh, so go finish your education, then go and maybe work for uh, a year, two, three years in, in a, um, a good space company or the space agency or whatever, but always keep that spark in your mind and, and be innovative and think about things to do and don't be afraid to explore new ventures and, and new ideas. So I'd be very happy if what we see in the world, and we have some very good examples sitting here, uh, uh, two of uh, Japanese startups. So uh, I would really like to see more and more of those. Thank you very much. How about Chris? <laughs> uh, I'm a big student uh, supporter. We often, um, invest in the University of Colorado, uh, where we are right now, but other universities in the past for sponsored research. So we, we get a lot of students involved right away and we, we essentially underwrite their master's or PhD uh, research into specifically now uh, weather and, and, and sensor um, developments. So those um, Certainly, uh, new PhDs are already hired two of them that you know, brought in after they got their degrees, uh, bring them back into the company, and they're already started in a small company. So I don't know if it's set up the, similarly here, whether uh, the smaller or larger companies actually uh, have sponsored research into the different universities, then that's, that's certainly an excellent way uh, to get collaboration all the way around. Uh, get some of the education paid for and start creating the intellectual property toward hopefully the missions that matter uh, and services that matter. So you shouldn't be uh, certainly fearful of smaller companies or bigger companies just as long as you're getting into tasks that are oriented into uh, uh, generally small groups of people to actually make things happen. So I, I normally encourage that and we actually do that uh, by sponsoring research. Uh, I've done that at University of Colorado, uh, School of Mines, Colorado School of Mines, University of Florida, Virginia Tech. I went to Virginia Tech, go Hokies. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, just stay with it and hopefully there's other research that you could be doing even before you start joining companies. So I would just add one thing and that is that there's some mega trends out there that are really fascinating, especially from a student point of view, because they define the world you'll live in. Um, launch costs are not going up. In fact, they're they're very likely to continue to drop like a stone um, now that we've got apparently SpaceX has reusable launch vehicles working, um, and there's you know a half dozen plus satellite companies working on launch. Um, and at the same time, hardware costs continue to fall. You know, starting with CubeSats, and then it's starting to spread into small sats. And I think from a student point of view, these are both fantastic things because if satellites cost a billion dollars a piece, there's no way anybody's going to take a risk on giving any major role in building those satellites to somebody who's just a year or two out of school. But if satellites cost a million dollars and in the not too distant future, maybe they cost $100,000, 
um, then there's much more opportunity for innovation and much more opportunity for early innovation early in the career. So I kind of agree with uh, previous statements, you know, think creatively, um, think about what's going to happen in the space industry as all these prices continue to fall and as more and more opportunities unfold as the prices fall. Thank you very much. Um, we have only one question from the audience. Question or comment? Short question, please. <laughs> um, I'd like to hear thoughts on current valuations. Um, the, uh, the unicorn is the mythical beast of the private equity company worth a billion dollars. Um, Rocket Lab is supposedly worth a billion dollars now. Planet is worth a billion dollars. Uh, do you think that these valuations are sustainable or accurate or possibly even still going to go up? All right, I like it. that's a dangerous question, but I'll, I'll start. So I would say this, the valuations in a startup phase are always a combination of, of risk and total addressable market. So if, um, say, Rocket Labs um, becomes the major player for rocket launches, then their current valuation is a fraction of what it should be. And the same thing for Planet. If Planet becomes the major player for Earth observing satellites, then their current valuation is a fraction of what it should be. So I think all of these are very early phase companies and what the market is betting on is that there is a reasonable chance that those companies will someday be worth 10 or 100 times what they're worth now. Um, so I, that's about the best I can tell you is that, is that it's, a, it's, a, it's almost an, you know, an unstoppable force and an immovable object. You know, it's a very large possible number a, and some fraction of a chance that they'll get to it. But both of them, I mean, the reason for the high numbers and the reason I think the high numbers are not crazy is both of them are addressing incredibly large markets if they're, if they're ultimately successful. I just want to add one thing. A lot of uh, even that valuations are they're either like pre pre revenue or they might be in revenue but they're still losing money and they're still the value of, of the company is going up although they're still losing money so it's it's uh, one aspect is bizarre I think our VC friend down at the, end of the table ought to be telling us why the valuations are sometimes so high but but um, it is. It, there, it's a huge market. And, you know, for us, the weather market, the, the climate corp had said it's like $9.7 trillion of, of impact. But you're not going to monetize anywhere close to that. But no, everybody on the planet is, is addressable as a market from, from a weather perspective. So, you know, it, it can be huge, but is it, does it really uh, pop in an IPO? And is, it really, is that really created that way? We'll, we'll find out. I think that the easy thinking about the internet. So the, nobody knows that Cisco is coming to the, this big company in uh, 30 or 40 years. So in the beginning, they just uh, pr um, manufacturing very maniac the communication devices, but it's uh, kind of a um, trillions of devices around the world. So the um, space industry is in the same stage, in the, like uh, internet in uh, 1998 or 1999. So, yeah, everybody can understand very easily in the same example. So now time is coming. So final short remarks, all of you, from all of you, please. I think the theme for, the, for this discussion was small satellites and how, how they change uh, the world. We're, we're at the uh, beginning or in the middle of, of a revolution in the space business. Uh, as people have said, it would have cost you hundreds of millions of dollars to build a satellite. Today you can do it in, in every university uh, and in every high school. J just for an example, in Israel we have a high school who is operating at the moment two satellites in space, two nano satellites. So prices are going down, technology is moving forward, markets are, are developing. So this is a revolution that goes on and we need to take charge of this revolution, we need to use it, we as entrepreneurs, as people are developing, developing space technology and using it, um, we should not be afraid to utilize it to our own needs and to improve uh, our lives here 
and to build successful business. So yes, small satellites are getting smaller, the markets are getting bigger, space sector is becoming more and more influential on our lives and more and more involved in everything uh, that we're doing. Okay, um, so you see so many space startups here in the world and I think the, the next thing we will see would be democratization in space. We see a lot of data available and more and more player comes in this, into this field to create a new application based on that. So um, this is, uh, you know, there are still a lot of opportunities uh, for all, all of us to um, create a new industry using, utilizing those uh, assets. So um, I think, you know, there are so many students here in this hall. So I would like you to uh, join uh, these activities and I, I would like uh, to work together to create a new big thing uh, for the future. Thank you. Yeah, I'd more just encourage, especially the students, go ahead and start a company. I mean, just do it. it it's, it's, uh, you'll never know how much pain it can be and how much fun it can be also. But the big thing is when I mentioned earlier about the markets, um, make sure the physics is correct on your side because you're not going to succeed if you're not following some laws of physics. And I see that in some of these other startups. It's like, well, even if it's perfect and, and it looks like you're still violating the second law of thermodynamics, and F equals MA still, you know. So uh, it's really kind of amazing at some of the startups when they get out, they, they flush out really quick. Um, but just because you have a good idea for a good service, make sure there's, you know, both the technology is, is either available or you could develop it soon enough to, to actually make it happen. Because um, uh, earlier I talked about, is the timing right? It might be a great idea and the technology is there, but it's going to be another several years before that market is able to, to um, generate. So either you have a lot of money in the bank to be able to um, create that market, or, you know, you're just going to fail because of timing, although everything else is nice. Yeah, thanks. So I think that, echoing what some of the other folks said, I think that the interesting place we are right now is, is a very rapid growth phase for space, especially for commercial space. We call it, one of, our, one of my slides said at the top, Moore's Law goes to space. I think part of what, is, what has made Silicon Valley possible and made the venture capitalists in Silicon Valley a lot of money is the fact that computing gets half as, half as expensive every 18 months. And, and the brain always thinks linearly, so nobody has any idea what that means. You know, nobody had any idea 10 or 20 years ago that that meant we could have supercomputers in our pockets and our cell phones. Um, and, and we're entering a similar phase for commercial space, which is really fascinating. So we're entering a phase where the, where the um, ability to get stuff into space will go down roughly at a Moore's Law rate. And, and what that will mean for the industry, I think, is what you know, all you guys have to help us figure out what that will mean. Oh, thank you. Uh, so every time I had an interview from the media, the, all the, um, the journalists are talking like that, space business is kind of not dreaming, and uh, it's, um, you have a big dream or something like that. But uh, it's not a dream, it's a, it's a um, reality we have. And uh, the, these gentlemen uh, had a um, uh, fair amount of money, and uh, um, we are creating a new business. So the, everyone in this venue is uh, very related to the space technologies and um, it, it's a timing that everybody can jump in and uh, space is not limited to the uh, technologists or the researchers, scientists, it's open for everyone. So let's open up that space for everyone. Thank you. Um, as an investor, uh, we look at the art space tech as a space startups are promising area in the future. Uh, so, but uh, however, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, people is the most uh, key part uh, here in Japan to uh, increase the number of their space tech startups. So um, as an investor, I want to uh, facilitate this uh, ecosystem here in Japan. So please feel free to contact me and the other gentlemen here um, to when you consider the uh, start your own companies. 
Thank you very much for your excellent presentations and comments. And thank you very much for your attentions.